Hi, everybody. My name is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics, and I'm answering questions again. So, John, so John Dad Dabo9383, who I know I've seen your name a lot, your handle. So, I know you're watching a lot of my videos, you comment. I just want to say I appreciate um, the fact that you do interact so much and that you do uh, watch these videos. So, thank you. So, you said two questions. Can someone have success and do, and this was based on the Trino Waveforming Technology Explained video that I did. Can someone have success in doing this without using a Trinov or Storm processor? And would uh, that then simply be a double subwoofer array technique? Um, my eight subwoofers are very deep and non-in wall. They're 28 inches, 26.5 acoustically. Should I therefore be placing the woofers side of my subwoofers towards the wall? And if yes, with a gap of say 0.5, one inch, one and a half inch, thank you. P.S. Also, and I assume that that matters, I do have independent control over volume distance phase and ability to apply PEQ to each of the eight subwoofers along with PEQ independently applied to each overall array, front and rear. So there's a couple of things here. The First off, Storm has Durac and Durac has ART, active room treatment, which is different from waveforming. They are both a MIMO, we'll call it related approach in that they have they take multiple measurements in the room to sample the wavefront and then use multiple speakers in an interactive way to correct the response. It's different from other approaches that may use multiple subwoofers in that what it's actually doing is sending signals designed to cancel reflections. Not So the typical approach that we use doesn't really cancel modes, and it, it actually tends to just excite the modes more evenly. Um, and what this is doing is preventing the creation of modes in the first place. So both of them have the ability to do that. But waveforming is a bit different, and waveforming's approach relies on arrays, and it does have spherical waveforming, and um, and then it has the standard planar waveforming. So I've mentioned this before. So spherical means a sphere, right? Like so, an ice cream cone shape, basically kind of emanating out of the speaker. And um, the way that can be thought of is that this ice cream cone shaped method that's being used, which is one of the options now with waveforming will still prevent sidewall reflections, but there's no vertical control, and it doesn't do quite as good a job. But you still get really good decay control and, and a nice smooth response for the most part. The planar wavefront, though, um, is formed, it creates basically like, I refer to sort of like a sticky sound wave. It's stuck to the sidewalls, the floor, and the ceiling, and it covers it all evenly, and it, as a result of that, it doesn't reflect. And so you don't get sidewall reflections, and you don't get ceiling floor reflections, what you do still get is back wall reflections, but you have a subwoofer array back there that cancels that out. Okay, so you guys get that. I've been talking about that. Does that require Trinov? No. You could actually create a planar wave using, and this is Trinov has never claimed to have invented these arrays. They're simply using them to make their own algorithm work better. So the idea is prevent problems in the first place with a good design, use software then to optimize it. So you can build an array in the front with properly spaced subwoofers. They, it, the time alignment is not what you would think. There's not a lot of special processing. They just need to be time aligned to each other in that array. It's the placement relative to the dimensions of the wall that are so critical. So here's what happens. Those arrays tend to only work over a limited bandwidth, and you need to have more and more subwoofers to get a higher frequency planar wave. Otherwise, the planar wave falls apart. There's another problem. Things like chairs, risers, changes in the texture, basically, of the room disturb the planar wave and end up causing a result that at the seating position is always not always that great. So you can do this with nothing more than a standard, any old processor going into something like a mini DSP. You may not even need that. The only advantage of the mini DSP is if you've got the one subwoofer out from the processor you can process a front and a rear signal. You don't need to, as I said, there's not a lot of processing, processing that needs to happen across the different subs in each individual array. So if you've got an array in the front and you've got an array in the rear, what you do is you invert the rear array signal and you delay it by the amount that's the distance of the room. That will cancel the length mode. And in the front, we don't do anything to it. It's just standard processing. You just place the subwoofers in the right location and you get pretty good results other than you need enough of those subwoofers to get a good height. So if you want to get up to like 80 or 100 hertz in typical sized rooms, you may need six to eight subwoofers in a proper array, maybe more. Well, 
One of the neat things about the turnoff processing is that it can use its DSP power to optimize what's sent to each of those in order to expand that bandwidth a little bit and to get better results in the area where the where it starts to fall apart. And so you what you'll find is more consistently better results. And so that's that's really where the magic, if you will, of that algorithm comes in, is that it, it's going to work in more rooms more consistently and you can get away with less subwoofers than you might otherwise need. It doesn't mean that if you use more subwoofers and do a more optimal array, you don't get better results. It's kind of like if you were thinking about this from the standpoint of like you're designing a car, you might be able to make let's just say a smaller engine, make that car just as fast. But if you give it a bigger engine with the right performance envelope, you've started with an easier platform to work with in the first place. Um, and so you don't have to take as many other efforts to make things work just right. So in, in anything audio, there's always trade-offs. And one of the problems you sometimes run into is that, yeah, you can spend more money to get more. You know, we deal with this with like channel count too. You can spend more money, add more speakers, use higher channel count processors. But in many cases, even if we have big budgets, we've got other things that limit the ability to do that, including potentially just channel count limits on the processor. And what happens then is you have to make decisions about how to get the best results with less. So it's the same thing here. In many cases, we just don't have the luxury to put in, you know, again, if you did eight subwoofers in the front and eight in the back, that's 16 subwoofers, even if they were 12 inch subs, it gets pretty expensive, including with waveforming, everyone needs its own amplifier. As I said, with when you're not doing waveforming, when you're just doing it, you actually can get away without doing that. Um, it's what we call it the analog approach. But with waveforming, everyone needs its own amplifier, and it just gets really expensive. And so if we can use that DSP to our advantage, but reduce it from eight in the front and eight in the back to something like, just as an example, four in the front and two in the back, now we only have six subwoofers, and we can get very, very good results. They may not be exactly equal to that eight in the front, eight in the back, but they may be really close. And um, and we've now spent way less money in a less complicated system. I mean, one of the problems we've been having with waveforming, which would be even more true of these analog approaches, is it's really hard to fit the left, center, and right speakers in these arrays without putting them in the wrong place. So it's like either the array drivers need to go in the wrong place or the LCRs need to go in the wrong place, but it's really hard to get them all in the right place. So... I hope that was helpful. Um, the fact that your subwoofers are really deep, the only thing I'll mention is that you may start getting SBI RFX at the upper bandwidth of it. Um, and so you can turn them. Oh, that was another question you said. Can you turn them to the side? Yes, and that gets rid of those SBI RFX, but you do need more than half an inch. So I would recommend five or six inches, actually. Uh, and you may need to play with it just to see what happens. But you can get, it's going to load the driver a little bit, and it can actually cause uh, chuffing. It can kind of act like a port where that, aperture that you've created is too small for the amount of air movement through it. So I, the other thing is you don't want the cone to hit the wall. So half an inch, probably the cone's going to hit the wall or the surround at least would. So I hope that's helpful, John. Um, everybody else, hope that was helpful for you too. For those of you who have been like, I don't understand what Trinov did. This is not new. They've had these arrays forever. You're, you're right. What they did was they developed a DSP algorithm that allows it to work better yet under a wider range of circumstances and often with less speakers. So Hope that's helpful. Subscribe to my channel. Those subscriptions really matter. Um, keep interacting in the comments section. That actually matters too. And I enjoy those conversations. And again, donations are super helpful. So thanks for those donations.